Oh, and what I'll do is um, I'll I'll we'll we'll go uh, Ed, and then we'll go Nick, and we'll all introduce ourselves. I'll, I'll introduce myself, and then I'll say I'm here with, and then Ed will introduce himself and say, and joining us for the first time is, and then Nick, you'll introduce yourself. Sounds good. Yep. Yep. Hey, good. Whew. Oh, for a second there, I thought I'd lost you. <laughs> All right. Three, two. Oh, let me uh, let me make sure that my phone isn't going to explode here. All right, there we go. Only deep emergencies. Three, two. Oh, I don't know what episode this is of the review crew. Uh, they say I never I never pay attention. Whatever. Three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the No Persinium Review Crew Show. I am your guest host for the week, Noah Nelson, the host of the No Persinium Podcast and our publisher. This week we're talking about Tribeca Immersive on this episode. I don't know the numbers of the Review Crew Podcast. Uh, joining us this week uh, is a couple of folks who were on site at Tribeca. I checked out things at home. First up is our New York City correspondent, Edward Milkreist. Hi, uh, pleasure to be here. And joining us for the first time is uh, Nick Fortuno. Uh, very happy to be here. So excited. Uh, you know, uh, it is, it's particularly special to have Nick on the show. We've gone to Nick's pieces, and a couple of months ago, Nick reached out and said, "Like, hey, I'm seeing a bunch of stuff and writing up reviews. So why don't I do this with you guys?" And then we were like, "Yes!" And this is uh, first time we've been able to have Nick on the show, so very exciting. Uh, we've got a whole bunch to get through. Uh, before we get into it, just want to note that Tribeca Immersive has wrapped up at this point. Uh, and I want to give shout outs to those who won awards in the competitions. Um, the Tribeca X Award, which is a, a brand integration award, went to Emerging Radiance. And then in the immersive competition, the Storyscapes Award went to Kubo Walks the City, which I think we're going to mention in, in a bit here. Uh, there was a special jury mention for Storyscapes Award went to Evolver, which we're definitely going to get into. And the New Voices Award went to the LGBTQ plus VR Museum. And that's the folks who won the awards. We've got at least seven pieces we're going to try and run down for you in the next eight minutes uh and we're gonna kick it off uh with our newbie with nick uh who's gonna tell us about uh it's gonna kick us off kick off the conversation with the duo of pieces that came from the national film board of canada this year nick the floor is yours sure uh so there were um there are two pieces that that the national film board of canada which is you know which is as i think listeners of this uh podcast and people who follow no pro know it's been really an innovative very very innovative group in terms of forwarding uh new media on the web and in vr and in installations they, they constantly have been showing work at tribeca for years uh they had two vr pieces in the experience um both um you know sort of like viewable um vr not uh, really much interaction although mi like minimal interactions but not like room scale you weren't moving around um, one was a, a piece called Plastic Sapiens, uh, which was about, which was a meditation on plastic and queerness and uh, our, our relationship as organisms to the world. And then a second called This Is Not a Ceremony, which was about uh, First Nations issues in Canada and the, um, the, the experience of, uh, of Indigenous people in Canada in terms of, of some of the horrors they've experienced and sort of drawing attention to that in kind of a, a magically real way. Uh, and both these pieces, I thought, were really interesting to me as someone who's been watching VR at the festival level for a while, because um, in both of them, I saw a, a change in almost editing technique that made the pieces much more consumable to me. And mm. I guess what I wanted to reflect on in both of them um, was basically this freedom to move the user from place to place. Um, through some kind of simple transitions of the entire environment without really like relying on cinematic structures to do it, right? So in This Is Not a Ceremony, you would you would go through this process where there were a couple of people in front of you who were, who were poets. There were these men dressed in red and black and they would give like a little monologue about 
the a kind of chorus like monologue about the yeah. thing they were experiencing. And then a, a head would pop up in a circle in front of you that would be a witness to something that had happened, let's say someone dying in a hospital. And then without very with very little warning, maybe even no warning, you would be tr you would be transported to the hospital. And then you would be in the hospital with the person who was dying. And then you would hear the voiceover over that. And then after being there for a period of time and seeing some action there, you would just be transported back to the kind of central space of of this like de like this like desert landscape, the surreal desert landscape. When it was, what it I was like, like literally like the uh, a lodge. It was like a Blackfoot lodge, and you, yeah, you're, yeah, you're standing in the center in the fire in the lodge. Um, so you're you've got a real. They give a real grounded sense of where you are, and then use that to like set you off on these journeys that are even though you're not moving at all. Yeah. And, and that's what I liked is that like the, you, there was a sense of movement to the piece uh, where it flowed from moment to moment to moment, but it didn't feel like it had to like structure that very much for me or hold my hand very much. It could, it could, it could be confident in the way it was moving from moment to moment. And it made the narrative a little bit more shown than told than some of the work I've seen in VR documentaries before. And it, so it felt less like a documentary and much more almost almost like a video art piece, like a narrative video art piece that was just like moving me from place to place. And Plastic Sapiens was even more extreme that way because um, in that piece, there isn't a very strong narrative. It's more like a meditation on on history and an organic evolution and then the question of how plastics exist in the environment. But again, like moving me from environment to environment without a lot of prep, um, you know, like changing my situation as a way of sort of like signaling a change in the direction of the story and a confident exchange. And so I, I guess what I what I'm curious about is if like th that was my experience and it really was a transformative experience for me in VR because it was the first time I had seen VR pieces where I was like, I if someone told me to watch this, I would pay for a ticket at home. Like I would I would watch this as a meditation on these issues. Ed, I know I know you saw Plastic Sapiens. Have you, did you also check out This Is Not a Ceremony? Yeah, I did. And I can only echo uh, Nick's thoughts. Um, both really interesting pieces. Um, as far as VR is concerned, like 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 we, like we said, it, it is a, a stationary one. It's sitting and enjoying, but both are a, really interesting ways of uh, diving into the story. And particularly for uh, This Is Not A Ceremony, it was a hard hitting one. Um, talking about some of the um, uh, some of the instances of uh, neglect that have been uh, put in place, uh, particularly against indigenous folk here in America, it was hard hitting, but it was a beautiful way of uh, showcasing it because it's rather than just a documentary of, oh, watch this, it's and suddenly you're in that position, you're in the place where uh, some of these things occurred. And by contrast, yes, Plastic Sapiens was was uh, quite bonkers. It was really, for me, it was uh, the, the staple uh, body horror uh, piece of the VR show uh, this this year because uh, as you would uh, be transported around, you're invited to do some small actions like breathing in and breathing out, and uh, just by moving the arms. So there's something quite um, uh, tactile about, about that sensation. But as you would do that, something your hands became uh, more like uh, giant plastic forks, and then at one point they became plastic tentacles. It was uh, very surreal, but uh, a very fun uh, piece. So yeah, absolutely, completely echoing and agreeing with Nick. Two really excellent pieces, which I. I must admit, I didn't realize there's a connection between the two uh, until just now, but uh, two really excellent um, examples of VR on display this year. Yeah, I thought the storytelling, I mean, you know, we we talk with Colin, the, the filmmaker behind this, not a ceremony. I, I think the storytelling in, the, in that piece, which got its debut uh, at Sundance this year, uh, is just absolutely superb, um, particularly for, you know, 360 video, um, which I think is still like the the hardest of the 360 mediums to make compelling because you've got no real agency other than turning your head around. So the fact that he's able to really ground you in a, a sense of place and to give a sense of being transported so that you're, you're, you're a witness to what's going on. And indeed part of the fact, part of the point is that you don't have any power to change what has happened in the past only maybe how things are going forward. So I think that really grounds it. Um, for me with Plastic Sapiens, I've, I've seen that metaphor of like uh, time as verticality happen before. That's something they do in it. Like you're, you're starting in the past on the seafloor and then like uh, time advances and like you evolve over time. 
Uh, so I, I've seen that metaphor done before, and there was some light interactive stuff. So I wasn't as blown away by that one on a, on a technical level, just because I think I've seen some of those storytelling techniques used. Um, and and it was it was more interesting to me <laughs> than than like really arresting, uh, but but definitely still in that mode of um, you know uh, by starting to play around with some light interactivity you're able to uh kind of bridge the gap between the the person who's experiencing it between the audience and between the piece itself which actually i think lends itself to the piece i want to talk about next uh which is uh nine day, nine day la pena's please believe me uh which is also a uh six degrees of freedom piece this one's totally built in game engine uh the story is about a woman named Vicky Logan uh, who contracted Lyme disease and basically then struggled with it for the remainder of her life and ultimately passed away because of it. And part of that struggle, a big part of that struggle, was just not being taken seriously by the medical establishment except for this one doctor. And the whole piece is presented as kind of an investigation journalist's eye on the story, which is what Nani is. Nani's an investigative journalist. And it starts with a desk of a journalist and one of, there's a couple of photos on it. And one of the photos is of Nani de la Pena in the 80s. And then they use deep fake, deep fake techniques to have that photo be animated and Nani voices herself and starts telling us about being a reporter at Newsweek in the 80s, doing story, doing a big cover story about Lyme disease, and then having it sort of all just disappear. And then we drill down into this one story. And it's this series of scenes uh, that take place inside hospitals and research labs and, and, and these other spaces or offices uh, that we move through. Um, and we, we get pieces of the story as we go. And it all kind of culminates with um, actually with, with, with Vicky's passing. Uh, but we're also shown not just the individual impact of this disease, but we're shown the societal impact of what happens when um, uh, something that had been an epidemic, uh, even though a very, you know, well, not epidemic, but like a, yeah, no epidemic if it's, if it's an area. So a, a small epidemic, like a limited located uh, breakout of this disease that uh, what happens when it gets ignored? What happens when it gets swept on the rug, under the rug and uh, everyone moves on from the story because it's not interesting anymore? And I saw massive parallels with how we're sort of treating COVID at the moment, particularly long COVID. Um, and so the timeliness of the piece, I thought, I think is excellent. I initially wasn't going to watch it because I was like, oh, Lyme disease, that's so 80s. Like, why, why is this here? And because it was easy enough to see on the quest, I was like, ah, you know, Nani does good work. I'll watch it. And I was completely blown away by it. And to my shit, you felt shamed for feeling that way about Lyme disease by the end. Um, and just the, between technique and topic was absolutely uh, sort of stunned by how far um, the the using of a game engine to lay out a, a, a full narrative piece uh can be uh it's it's a i think it's a it's a milestone uh, particularly if you've been following nani's work since the earliest days of the vr renaissance right hunger in los angeles use of force uh these were critical pieces in the development of narrative vr uh, you know hunger in los angeles you know palmer lucky was the assistant on that production at Sundance, right? So like that's where we get the Oculus and everything from. Um, all of it starts in Nani's lab and she's really advanced her craft. And as far as interactivity with NVR, I think um, this is probably one of the most um, tactile in involved pieces that I, I got to see at least. Um, like you say, throughout there are moments where you can pick up uh, pick up the files and you can pass through them and you can look into the images and you can hold them up closer to your face or uh, slightly further apart. And like it's those small things which really helped make this um, what, what could have been a uh, lifetime uh, documentary or something. This it felt very real, felt very present, and and like you say, no, it felt very relevant to today. Um, it was a heartbreaking one, um, and 
the thing that's so beautiful about this story was that it's just a real story and it's a real person and there's no big theatrics there's no big um end of the world or anything like that it's but it's it's looking at the decline of this one poor woman's health uh, but looking at how that has now uh, developed and how has changed how we as society now look at Lyme disease and how it's treated, how it's researched. Um, one particular highlight, uh, if that's the right word for it, was that towards the end, um, after all of this talk about uh, her her cells and all of the different things that they've been able to do, there was a gallery where we were able to just walk through at your own pace of pictures of Vicky and her kids and her family and her loved ones. And it just really made it resonate that this was real life. This is a real story. This is somebody who who had this real lived experience. And to to witness some of the uh, awful uh, for-profit Medicare system that we have and having all that shown on screen, well, to, to our goggles. Um, yeah, it was a really impactful piece. Um, I was absolutely impressed by it. In person, there was room to walk around. Uh, we were asked not to. We were asked to use the teleport function uh, instead. Um, I think they may have had one or two issues with uh, people getting a little bit too into the story and close to the walls. Um, but this really was a, a very impactful piece. Um, bravo to the whole team who created this one. Well, and speaking of uh, stories about real people and impact, uh, you tagged Intravene as the first piece you wanted to lead discussion on. Yeah. Um, I mean, Intravene is hard hitting stuff. Um, this is from Darkfield. Uh, those of you who listen to the podcast have probably heard of them before, but if you haven't, they're a British-based audio production company. Um, they Their stories are all, uh, certainly for the last while, have been orientated around audio stories, audio plays, audio podcasts, all that stuff. Uh, but here, this is a collaboration uh, with Noah, the collaboration. Uh, the collaboration is with uh, the Crackdown podcast. Uh, yes. And also with uh, filmmaker Brenda Longfellow, who uh, is who b- brought everybody together uh, for this particular piece. Oh, thank you, Noah. Saving the day as always. And uh, yeah, so for this piece, it's uh, telling the story of uh, the ongoing uh, drug crisis going on in uh, Toronto, Canada uh, at the moment and looking at some of the... Um, overdose prevention centers, uh, which they have there set up uh, in order for people who uh, want to or need to uh, take whatever substances can do so in a safe environment where they are uh, looked over, where they are, um, where there's always nurse and um, practical medical help there. Uh, but for this experience, um, certainly in person, it was uh, quite special. Uh, you walked into a room, uh, there were all posters all around about the different drugs on offer and about the help that you could seek and all that sort of stuff, immediately putting you into the world uh, of this center. Uh, sat down at a desk and made to look into a mirror and I looked straight back at myself into the side. There's a, a, a syringe uh, drop-off bin if I want to use it. Uh, I place the headphones on and the next thing I know, the lights go off completely. Um, and when I say it is a dark room, it is, uh, we're we're instructed to close our eyes, but I must admit, I, I peeked open once or twice and I couldn't tell the difference. It was pitch black in that room. I mean, just, just the effect of being able to do that in this random, uh, business, uh, site here in Tribeca was, uh, quite impressive, but the entire piece, um, is really beautiful and really quite haunting, um, it just puts you in the day to day situation. You hear the stories of some of the people going in and out. You hear about some of the drugs which are being used. You hear about uh, the the lifestyle of one of the nurses and their pet dog who is there. The dog is there uh, to go and check up on people. And if there's no reaction, then they know that something's going wrong. Like it is hard hitting. And this is not an experience necessary for everybody. Um, And particularly when we were in person, the, the, the people on the door did say, if you feel uncomfortable at any point, please let us know and we'll, we'll come and get you. Um, but this piece was absolutely stunning. Um, enjoy is always the wrong word when, when we're talking about something like this. But yeah, um, just, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, keep going. Incredible. <laughs> well, again, it, it's... It's one of those pieces where I'm so glad I've experienced it. I don't know how I can explain the experience without people doing it themselves, which perhaps is the best possible um, promotion and best possible um, 
thing I can give to, to give to it. Like people should experience this. Uh, it is now publicly available, uh, I believe, or it is coming out in stages over the next couple of uh, weeks and months. Uh, there are two parts initially, and I think it may expand over time. Um, but just the realness of this story, uh, coupled with the presentation was fantastic. There's a little bit of magical realism in it. There's a little bit of very clever background music, very clever sound design. Uh, and in the room, they made use of uh, subwoofer uh, systems to really uh, punch home every now and then. But truly a, a, an important piece. Well, and uh, this is something we, we've all checked out. So Nick, what was your take on uh, on Intervene? I mean, I, I absolutely agree with Ed on the um, on the content of the piece, right? Like, I think that it was a story that I didn't really. I mean, I know about a little bit um, because of um, some of the experimentation with overdose prevention in in the U.S. and my own research, and but I've never had like any any like first person understanding any like experiential reality of what that was, and that was kind of incredible. Uh, and I I do think, and I agree, people should should hear it because it doesn't go where you think it would even if you research these issues it's a much it brings a reality home about what we're talking about what's going on there that i just think is very powerful i guess my 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 issue with it is is just weirdly that i've done other dark field stuff before and i think when i think about the other pieces i've done that i think are incredible right like um like like not right just technically was amazing Right. To sit in a car and, you know, and then hear sounds around a car that sounded like people moving around a car. I that like blew my mind. And I was a little disappointed in um, in Benzodope that like that wasn't used to the same effect. Right. Like I didn't it, it felt like I heard a very, very good uh, kind of comprehensive art, art kind of inspired audio piece on a topic. And it was definitely moving and informative. But it didn't bring the kind of like hyper accuracy that I could get from something that Darkfield had done before. And so I felt a little bit like, oh, you kind of like you, you made me a really great meal, Darkfield. But where was that spice I always come to you for? I felt like a little bit of lacking there. Mm. I mean, I, I, I could definitely feel them restraining themselves a bit in the piece. Uh, if only because I, I, I mean, well, and not, not fully restraining themselves either because the framework, uh, you know, has you in like this kind of limbo space. And so you, you have these really grounded moments that are happening in the actual, um, uh, overdose prevention site, the OPS, uh, and that's real tape. And then when your point of view overdoses you kind of go to limbo and it becomes this surrealist there's your numbers being called like it it sounds like you're in you know the waiting room of death uh, but you're told you're not gonna die like you're not you're not gonna die now we're they don't say we're gonna send you back but it's like don't worry you're not gonna die and all that is completely you know fictional um and so they didn't fully restrain themselves from from going into you know, docudrama kind of art infused mode, but they definitely held back from the kind of you know, tricks they they've been doing. They've done in the past. Like I've definitely had experiences with dark field where it, it was uncanny. It was like, no, it really sounds like someone's in the room with me. This is disturbing. And this definitely didn't have that exact same quality, but I almost wonder like <laughs> the question isn't, would it would it not be ethical to do that? I think maybe the question is, would it would it start to make the real people maybe feel a little cheap and make it feel fake by trying to make it too real? Does that make sense to you guys what I'm scratching at there? Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, I mean, this is admittedly, this was also my first dark field experience. Uh, shame on me. I know. Shame on me. I know. No, no, um, shame on you. But that, that, that also frames us like, you know, you, you weren't ready for the whole night. No, no, I was not. But that's the other thing is that I think so often it, the stereotypical images of, oh, these are the people who do drugs, or this is what a junkie looks like or whatever, like something we can strip that away. And it becomes this thing of just, here's real people, here's real conversation. And 
yes, I mean, maybe from a storytelling point of view, maybe we'd love it if there was more juicy gossip or anything like that. But actually, like you say, like the ethical thing here perhaps is to keep it as straight as it comes and to tell real genuine stories. And for me, at least, I think that's what made the piece land as hard as it did. Yeah, let me just say that uh, when I when I'm giving my criticism, this is like a nitpicky criticism of having experienced a lot of dark field stuff and being very, very impressed by it. And in a way, Ed, I think you did it like the right way. I would even suggest like if you've never done any dark field stuff before, uh, if you're listening to this, do Benzodope first and then go back and try to get access to not or double or something like that so that you can see what what uh, Noah and I are talking about in terms of like how actually far they can push this technology to do something really immersive. Because I think, again, I just want to, I want to stress this, like Benzodope is really fascinating and, and really informative and it brings an emotional power to what it does. So when I'm critical of it, I'm only critical of it knowing what Darkfield can do technically, not because that piece was, was lesser. It's just, if that piece hadn't been called Darkfield, I probably wouldn't have guessed it was a Darkfield piece. Oh, um, interesting. Even it was very good. Yeah. I mean, the, the, yeah, I mean, aside from like the chrome that they have on there, like the beginning, like dark field radio, like all that stuff, like the, the usual framings, at least in the version I, I heard. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like if, if that stuff hadn't been there and like the recognizable um, computer voice hadn't been part of the mix. Yeah, I might, maybe I wouldn't have guessed it either. Um, come to think of it. But, but no, I think, I think, I think your point is, is really good. And I'm, I'm interested in, in the question, particularly when it comes to telling you know, docudrama is always a fascinating discipline, a fascinating practice because you need to present your, your aim is to present a version of the truth, but you do have artistic license within there. And so how do you navigate that line? Um, is is no matter whether you know it's a it's a television doc or a film um or i suppose even like a a a doc docudramic video game which i guess i think there's been some of those over the years and having a hard time remembering if there's there's been one like like stories in in stories done some stuff in that space right yeah exactly so like um yeah like how like here in this in this relatively new medium of spatial audio storytelling with one of the more tricky forms like how far can you push it before it it just starts to kind of fall fall apart on itself and like i don't know like i kind of agree with you like they 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 could have maybe gotten a little wilder if they wanted to um but i'm i'm not sure what that would do to the the integrity of of the of the piece so i guess we'll see i know there's at least there's, there is one more piece that's currently available. So the first two episodes are available on Darkfield Radio for those who want to check them out. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if they're – Nick, you you experienced it that way. Were they free? I can't remember. Or uh, The after? first episode is about $6 US, okay. uh, five pounds, and the second episode appears to be free. Okay, cool. So uh, the second one's free. That's interesting. Uh, okay. I know our original plan was to talk Evolver right here, but I realized that we we, we backed two Ed pieces back to each other. That doesn't work. Um, let's crack open into the AR section, and uh, Nick, let's have you let's have you dive in uh, with uh, starting with Iago. We're gonna we're gonna see on the technical side, and we might talk about some of the other AR pieces as well. Sure. So Iago is a is an AR piece in which uh, when you approach the station, there were a bunch of little like almost like uh, uh, like uh, miniature model sets of a of a scene. Right. Like like it wasn't really clear what they were when you walked up. It, it was just it was kind of like like almost like a diorama like scene. Um, and then when you took the device up and you looked at it, um, it activated and then you basically watched a music video play that was that was set in the world of the Shakespearean play Othello. And it was kind of talking about, um, you know, like, so, like the issues of jealousy, essentially, that 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 ground the play. Um, it was so OK, so so what was interesting to me about it uh, was that I I wasn't sure why 
was Zayar exactly, right? Like it was uh, like the assets were very video game and it remi- the thing it reminded me most of is like uh, like you know kind of concerts and and live performances that happen in places like Fortnite and Roblox where like game assets are used to tell stories and you know like so so what would happen is like the character a character would be walking around singing and then like props or or background characters would manifest on the screen it had a kind of sci-fi narrative uh game space where you'd see people like leveling up with like little game like interfaces at various points in the story a monster would appear and sort of shriek over the environment as characters were acting and this was all again through ar so you're like watching it on a on a on a screen as it's appearing on this diorama that you're looking at but when i watched it i I kind of felt like i'm not sure what this ar relationship is giving to me right like i i think it's a music video it's it's fine as a music video i think the assets are good i it, it like if i kind of a land in its game like aesthetic which i didn't really like very much but if i sort of accept that as the reality then it, they did a good job kind of putting the whole thing together uh it it worked without hiccup right like i watched the whole thing and i was moving around in space and it, it held up so technically it felt strong but i wasn't sure like what the purpose was really i didn't i didn't understand why i watched it i, I didn't think it was a super original take on the content honestly um but mostly i felt like this doesn't feel different to me than me watching this in a 3D world. I'm not sure why this is AR right now, rather than something that could have been put on in a in a Roblox like world, and I could have just watched it in that context. Ed, I know, I know you checked it out and you you dug the music on this one. Yeah, that, that's that's really interesting. I mean, I don't disagree with you, Nick, but I would say I actually enjoyed this piece quite a lot. The I mean, the musical take on it was very fun. It was a rock opera take on uh, on the the actual Shakespeare words from Othello, which uh, I didn't realize the whole um, uh, was envy being the the green eyed monster. Like that's the whole whole play of the song, and it's the chorus, and it comes back and over and over again. Um, Yes, yeah, so, I mean, like you say, Nick, that the assets were very, very video gamey. It was almost like a, a Halo style, future Marine Corps that sort of thing, uh, with a gender flipped Iago for those who are familiar with uh, Otello. Um, I, I enjoyed it. I, I, I dug it. I mean, it's it for me. One of the things which was actually lacking a lot from this year's uh, Tribeca, if I'm being um, picky is lightheartedness uh there were very few pieces which were lighthearted, and i know it's an art festival and i know that it's a competition and that's part of why most probably what i'm seeing a lot of the time is a lot of the heavier and the more serious material but i mean i think we forget sometimes that we have this amazing technology and we can play like we can just enjoy and have fun and so um i mean for me like i dug being able to like really zoom in and be my own director for this music video um being able to look at it like you say that the technical side helped up really well i could rotate and go any angle i wanted and and it still held up really well it's overall purpose like is it going to change lives is it going to change the world probably not but was it one of the items that i had most fun at whilst i was doing tribeca probably so uh, definitely a, a little mixed bag here i think well, now you guys got to do this uh, on iPads, right? Like that's what they had mm-hmm. handed yep. for y'all? Okay, yeah. Mm. So I did it at home and I did it on iPhone. And I think that categorically changes the experience for the worse because you get these very tiny images and – you know, I'm I'm here and I'm and I, and I don't have a good table for this stuff, so I always do this stuff on the floor often. And so it was these tiny little figures that I'm trying to get a sense of what's going on, and it just just doesn't entirely work. And I often find this with this AR stuff on the phone, and and I get that an iPad or an iPad Mini form factor is better for this, but the vast majority of people are are going to be downloading these apps onto their phones. We're going to give the first crack at it, the first impression on the phone. And I think the assets that were made here, they're, they're perfectly good assets. The The choreography was was neat. Like if I was, Nick, to your point, if I was watching this in Fortnite or if I was in a VR headset and could be there in the space with it, like if the window's big enough, then this is a, this is a fun musical number. But when I'm restricted to the little proscenium I, I carry in my pocket, it, it becomes frustrating. Uh, like It's like I can't see what's actually going on. 
and giving me the agency to move around the space when that doesn't do anything or doesn't doesn't seemingly doesn't reveal context like it's not like say oh my goodness Carnegie Arena where if you move inside of a character there by accident uh you wind up being plunged into like their their inner physical selves and you hear a heartbeat and see the pulse and, and all the stuff and you kind of pull back out and like oh my god I just I just saw someone's heart blah right you know kind of this this shock moment that they do in that piece which everyone's shied away from trying to do sense because you know in route who did it so sorry everybody uh but but it doesn't yeah I, I just don't know why why ar and i and i'm always feeling like people are constantly like making ar stuff and they can't answer the question why ar and nick how do you how do you tend to feel with that question no, I mean, I, I feel very similarly. I think the, the most of the AR pieces I've seen, and I will draw one large exception out of pieces that have shown at the festival, which is the dial, um, where, where I was like, this is the one piece I've ever seen where you are looking at a model of a house and you're moving through time to solve a mystery as you like look at the house. That's the only AR piece I've seen where I was like, wow, that the AR is meaningful. The pieces in uh, Tribeca this year, I mean, there were interesting statements being made there. And I agree with that, actually, that it, it was the only thing I saw that felt light, right? It was the only thing that I saw that was trying to have fun um, there. And I and I, I want to I want to amplify that message that I don't see any reason why you couldn't just do more silly stuff in that space, too, and have it be meaningful. But none of the AR stuff felt um, felt purposeful to me. And I, the other pieces I did um, that were asking me to, like, uh, hum or sing or or wander around a space and place objects. It all just felt like I don't know why you're not just showing this to me. It's like if the purpose of this is the content and not the fact that I'm looking at it through this, even an iPad, I, I don't know why you're making me look through an iPad to see it. If 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 I could get a better experience somehow else and the AR isn't really meaningful yet. No, I do think a piece, and, and and you guys can definitely correct me if I'm wrong here, I think a piece that maybe does achieve something with that AR that was in the Tribeca you know, set was Emerging Radiance, which I only saw in the Museum of Other Realities, but they they recreated the mural um, fixture because there's three murals on the sides of a little kind of like a, evocative of a farmhouse piece. And then each of the murals can be activated via phone or, or pad to reveal an interview it, it, it's a short piece i think my my main criticism of it is just like i feel like there's i want more <laughs> i want longer interviews or i want there to be like here's this part here's that part like i understand why the segments are so short but i just wanted more from each of the subjects but each of the murals is a different voice a, a different person and the the one in the museum of other realities it like recreated the experience by having you like if you stood in a certain spot the ar uh fired off on top of the the existing mural but just like you know full scale um but but did you guys check that one out while you were there yeah I mean, it was uh the, the murals were on the wall which is lovely they're hand painted as well it's it's very pretty very lovely uh and there's just the subtle qr code in the middle um like you say, it's very short, very sweet, but it's um, exactly the sort of thing which I think as a kid you imagine, oh, the museums and the galleries of the future. Like this is what it will be like. Like as you walk by, they come to life and it talks to you. It's a it's a little minority report or a little whatever else you want to, other sci-fi thing you want to bring to mind. Um, but here it worked really nicely. Um, only a minute long maybe for each of these little interviews. Uh, but getting to hear the voices of uh, these uh, Japanese Americans who who went through the uh, internment process in uh, California uh, after, during, after World War II. Um, it's, this is exactly the sort of use of AR, which I can see actually having practical application in the world. It's the sort of stuff which I can see in five, ten years, even now. Like we could have this in our schools, in our galleries, in our it, it, in just a, as a way of supplementing the art. It's not taking away from, it's just adding to and it gives more context to it. And so like why wouldn't I want to scan a picture of the Mona Lisa and get 
uh, get a, a description of the artist and the time and when Da Vinci was alive and what it meant and all that sort of stuff. It's very, very simple uh, in this um, this particular iteration. Uh, I think it was Instagram filter it was using, uh, something like that. But it was it was a really nice little addition to the uh, to the festival. Uh, I, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I agree that it. You know the the hand painted murals were really nice, and the um, the 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 interactivity was short, but it was powerful. I thought the stories were good. I just felt, and it was cool actually that it was Instagram filters. That I was kind of I kind of kept staring at that actually, like in a meta way. I was just like, wow, we're actually doing this with Instagram. That's cool. Um, and that and I I think that ha- that speaks to some kind of potential. I just felt like all the pieces of it didn't quite add up to what the potential of this could be. I think that. It was interesting that the mural started to animate on my phone and the style worked so that it it did like if I looked through my phone, I could believe the mural was animating and that was cool. But I didn't it didn't add much to the mural itself when that happened. And I, I felt like the level of transformation it went to was deliberately trying to be subtle and f- be seamless with the mural. But that led it to be a little bit underwhelming to me. Um, I'm wondering what it would be like if it wasn't just a mural on a wall, because the photos I see of it from Museum of Other Realities have them on on more architectural spaces. Uh, yeah, and, and I wonder if that changed it somehow. Yeah, I mean, I, so the the more one, it was this little hut, and I think there were there's some photos also. I think they've built this little hut, uh, and so you could uh, it was just evocative of a farmhouse or, or of a workhouse on a farm. Uh, but it didn't have too many features. It had a roof, right? You know, you could see the roof. Um, but it it helps with like the vibe. And yeah, I mean, like it's in some ways like not groundbreaking. But I but I think that the fact that because you know if if you if you've been in this field long enough and you've seen you know pictures come to life via AR, you've seen pictures come to life via via AR. Like and and here at No Proscenium, we've seen a lot of that over the years. But the fact that this is going to wind up in a museum that it's doing documentary work, um, like like my main problem with it is just that it 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 is so short. Like each of the pieces, is, I think, like a minute long, and it's almost like once we've cracked that open, like why can't I get more? And probably the truth of that is because they only had so much money, you know. <laughs> but if there was a candidate here for hey, someone go and give this project more money, I think I think that one. Uh, would probably be the first on my list of like, oh, please, please, someone give some more resources to this because I think that as a model for um, the for the kind of things that AR as a as a tool can do, adding context to the physical environment is what everybody talks about, and here this is this doing that, um, and proof of concept's been proven now. I want to see more execution. Uh, and and I want to see companies like Meta, who are are listed as the producer of this one, you know, if they're gonna if they're gonna bring something like this to festival, like don't don't just give a little bit of resources to the filmmakers, like give some serious resources to the filmmakers. And you know, we we have an interview on the site with the director, and it's clear this story. I mean, this this is the story of their community. And this stretches back to this is like a, a multiple generation, not just like the impact of multiple generations of of the story itself, but the gathering of these stories has been part of their family since this all kicked off. Uh, something they inherited from their father, and I think that people bankrolling that kind of work, uh, it, particularly if they're going to use it as like a, a tech demo for you know what's capable on their platforms, they need to get serious with it. Um, and this is a perfect project for that kind of thing. I'm going to dismantle that soapbox I was just on. And <laughs> um, any Anything else before we pivot out of, of AR? Was there anything else in the AR deck uh, at the festival this year that uh, turned your head? Or um, There was a cute little one called uh, Reach You, which was uh, a little AR one, which I think, uh, Nick, you were alluding to earlier. Um, a message from the future they've been trying to reach you and and you 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 scan it and uh, a uh, the the portrait of a woman uh, uh, her head appears and talks to you about the future and the things that they're going through and asks a few questions um 
about the questions for this this particular iteration were about joy and about grief and about the things that we're going through today. Uh, and the idea is that this will continue to be expanded on and uh, supposedly uh, they're going to continue to update this one and with new questions and new features. It was a, a nice little piece. It's the sort of thing which I uh, think as an intro to AR is, is a perfectly lovely little thing to get somebody to download and just check out and see what they think. Um, but again, I think some of the things that we, we keep going back to is like, why are we doing this? Like, what is the function of it? Is it if it's just for because we have to make something AR, um, is that enough of a reason? Not really. Um, but this it was another uh, little piece, which was, yeah, quite, quite, quite lovely. Nothing, nothing groundbreaking, but, but, but very lovely. Nick, any notes on Reach You? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to check I, it out. I, it wasn't available for us. Yeah, no, I would, I would just say, I just I reinforced what Ed said. It, 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 you know, it wasn't badly made. It wasn't, um, it, w- it wasn't a poor execution on it. It just, I didn't understand why it was AR. And there's a certain, you know, there's a certain point where, um, in an installation where something tells me in the middle of an open space to give a message to the future, like verbally, <laughs> in you know, in front of, in front of like the 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 very hipply dressed people who have wandered in from the Tribeca Film Festival, I'm not going to do it, right? Yeah. Like I'm I'm not going to confess in an open room with all the people who just rolled in from the last premiere. So it, it was like it was an odd piece to to have exposed the way it was, uh, which again I think speaks a little bit to like you know what what is the reason for this thing to be AR? Yeah. I mean, like, it's got me, this whole thing has got me casting my mind around to like what AR pieces that that didn't involve having like a hollow lens or a magic leap on my face, like have moved me. And the only thing that I'm coming up with is, you know, Brianna's garden, right. Um, which I found to be incredibly effective and, and did also have an interactive component. Um, and when they've, they've stood that up in places and done installations, but it's also something you can just get on your phone. And so it can it sort of is in both very specific places and nowhere, nowhere specifically at all. Um, and, and that one feels like, and because there's, you know, a, uh, that's, that's, that's a piece that's a tribute to Brianna Taylor, um, uh, who, if you, if you don't know the story, you know, she, she, she died when cops raided uh the wrong apartment the apartment she was in uh in like the middle of the night and they just let her they they opened fire and she was you know what what they euphemistically call collateral damage which is a a vicious vicious term for a human life being snuffed out for no blessed reason uh in any case uh it's it's a rather lovely piece that was developed and and involved like her sister was part of it and her sister shows up in in part of it and there's like a cg version of of brianna uh and then there's um you know a a, a, like a a full mocap version volumetric capture version of her sister shows up uh, for part of it and it's just this this simple meditative piece and it's a tribute uh to a person and it, it all it all makes sense. It's, you know, someone's, someone has been stolen from us collectively and here's a chance for them to be back in the world. And so there's your answer for why AR for that piece, because VR wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same effect. Although I believe they've put up a VR version of it as well, but there is an actual, you know, you know, poetic artistic reason for it to be AR. And I, I feel like it's a very hard question like we we see it over and over again like people just don't seem to come up with an answer for like why is it got to be ar um and and i wish i wish we had more answers i wish i wish these pieces that were making the festival circuit you know knew why um ah okay that's (laughs) um let's uh let's keep me from talking for a moment uh there's one more piece in my setup but uh Ed, let's come back around to you. And here's here's a piece that feels like it could only right now happen on the festival circuit, and that and something that only you got to see, and that's Evolver. I know. I feel very very fortunate. This is this is maybe the one that uh, Iago, the Green Ed Monster, really was about me getting to do this, and you guys didn't. Um, but Evolver here is the um, 
it felt like it was the big staple piece that they were going for, uh, certainly during this festival. Didn't take place in the same uh, same venue. Uh, had to go for a little bit of a walk until you found this uh, very darkly covered uh, building. All the windows, all the doors completely blacked out. Um, going inside, everything is oh, as dark as it can be. It's a very uh, quiet uh, space inside. But uh, Evolver is a beautiful, beautiful uh uh, virtual reality meditation piece. Uh, first, there's fir- uh, there's first a, a, a period of meditation narrated by uh, Kate Blanchett of all people. Um, uh, before heading into this uh, fully uh, uh, movable, uh, walkable space where you are shrunk down to the size of an atom, maybe a little larger than that, and we witness the birth of life really we we see thousands and then millions of these little dots these little grains of what look like sand to begin with begin to float and move around in different spaces and as you move around you can, can as you you move your body through the space the the little pieces interact with you and they respond to your uh, would be touch but they gradually build and they form and they, uh, they they build together in different ways and suddenly they all turn red and suddenly you realize you're looking at the the uh, nervous system of, of of a human body and it all becomes it, it's that mix where it looks like a tree it looks like roots but then you realize it's the nervous system and you can look at this humongous um, body which starts to appear around you um, I really did have this this amazing moment where I looked around me and I couldn't quite understand where I was so I moved back a little bit further and I realized uh, I'd been standing inside a skull um, it was a beautiful beautiful piece um, it's it sounds a little sciencey a little maybe it sounds a little bit like um, uh, the magic school bus or something like that but this was a truly a beautiful beautiful piece um, it all culminates with uh, seeing the, the seeing all of these tiny dots and specks move and breathe together as as one unit. Uh, it really becomes a reflection on what we are, what our place is in the universe, what our place is, with how our cells work, how it all operates. It's it's very cerebral in in a lot of ways. And then towards the end, the whole thing culminates and it all almost like explodes into this giant uh, light mass, and it it. it almost felt sacred it almost felt like a religious experience um really a a very very special piece um not many people got to see it i I don't believe it was uh for mine at least i had an audience of six i think that's the max they could have at a time uh for the uh for, for, for the walkthrough very very impressive and this is the sort of stuff where um, when we talk about VR, this is the stuff that we imagine as kids. We imagine being able to walk through and experience and see and and, and have it change you and have, have it make sense. Narratively, there's not much going on, but as far as exploration and the internal questions which it raised um, and the feelings it, it left me with, it was uh, really, really quite extraordinary. Well, neither of us, neither Nick nor myself, got to check it out. But Nick, have you gotten a chance to see any of uh, Marshall Laser Feast's work before? Actually, no. And I was oh. supposed to—I was supposed to see this piece, and then my plane was delayed oh. getting back from LA. <laughs> so, so I have—I I yet remain inexperienced with Marshall Laser Feast. Well, well, I'll be—I'll be, I'll be uh, informed, jealous uh, for both of us uh, in that I've gotten to see their work in dome projection form. And I've gotten to see their work. Um, they did the uh, well. They they directed the virtual volume stuff for um, the RSC production, whose name is escaping me right now. But it was oh, the, dream. dream. I guess I did. See, I did okay, see yeah. dream. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so I, I I did see that. So like they so they both directed the mocap, and they also like that the environment, the virtual environment that it all takes place in. They designed that, and so I think they're they're really great in terms of creating these like beautiful strange virtual environments but i've never got to be inside one i've only ever watched one on a screen and it kind of has always driven me nuts because they were always very obviously meant to be (laughs) seen from the inside at least in terms of the qualities of what was being built so uh ed i'm jealous that's what i'm trying to say Honestly, I I feel very very fortunate to have got to see it. Um, and yeah, like I said, like this is 
this is why I want to see more VR. It's because it's it's because of stuff like this where it just feels like an experience I couldn't do in any other medium. Like I, I don't feel like this would work just watching it on a screen. I don't feel like this would even even playing it as a video game. It wouldn't work. This is the sort of thing where being in the reality, being able to walk through and experience it in my own pace and my own space. Like there, there really was this moment. I, I traced my hand across the hand of this giant celestial body. And it really was like this moment of like, like who am I to be witness to this creation, which is just regular life. Like it was like transcendent. Like I, I can't, I can't describe it in a, in a more flattering way. I don't think. Um, but truly a, a fantastic piece. Well, we're coming up at the end of our hour. And while I've got you here, uh, Nick, you, you you have a nice longitudinal sense of immersive as a whole. Um, I want to toss to you uh, just to get your, your overall thoughts on uh, you know what you've seen out of uh, curated out of Tribeca this year. And if you've got a sense of sort of the, the state of storytelling uh, on the sort of technical immersive side. Yeah, I, I, you know, it was interesting. Normally, Tribeca, Tribeca's immersive side, which is, you know, storyscapes and, you know, all the forms it's taken has felt a little bit like, like, like it's, it's felt a little bit kind of miscellany to me, right? It's it, in the past, it's felt like some of it was cutting edge and some of it was backward looking and some of it was like, like a little bit off in terms of like the tone of where the world was. And this was the first Tribeca where I felt like I was seeing an evolution of form, right, in a real way. And I mean this particularly in VR. I thought all of the VR I saw was more confident, more sophisticated, more polished than things I had seen previously, and even things I had liked previously. And that was incredible. And so I think the takeaway I had from 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 Tribeca is that, you know, when I used to, when I taught, when I teach VR, um, I sometimes talk about how, like, we don't, quite know how this thing is edited yet, right? Like we're at a point where we're still figuring out, like it's making film and still figuring out editing, right? Which is of course is film, right? Uh, and this was the first time I've seen VR pieces of that narrative style where I was like, oh, this is a stab towards what VR pieces could be like in the future. Like this is the actual form that VR pieces could be in the future. I look at, um, you know, when I think about the three VR pieces we talked about, like this is not a ceremony in terms of its, its confidence in moving from scene to scene, uh, uh, Plasta Sapiens in terms of the use of this very simple interactivity of breathing in and out and twisting it around this narrative of plastic and queerness to be something kind of creepy. And then everything that we described in Nani's work of, of, of doing a more robust um, uh, investigative journalistic piece that gives you some affordance to like look around. These are not the same like editing techniques. These are not the same movements, but they're all pushing forward a kind of storytelling that becomes more unique to VR. And so that was exciting to me in a way that I, I'll, I'll confess, I don't often find the Tribeca immersive as a whole exciting. Very interesting. Very interesting that. Well, we'll have to sit down and, and compare even more notes on on the, the state of the world of, of VR storytelling uh, in, in the not too distant future. Um, I'm going to say that wraps us up for this week here on the Review Crew cast as we get into the 16-minute mark. And I'm going to try and do this next part uh, from memory. Uh, as you know, NoPro is a labor of love. Everyone you see and hear on the site and in the podcasts uh, is a volunteer, except, of course, for me. Uh, and uh, I'm funded by the Patreon at patreon.com slash noproscenium. You can see how much, uh, how much I make. It's, uh, it's, it's not a lot. Uh, so if you can, if you enjoy uh, what you hear, uh, if we are a vital instrument for you, uh, think about uh, dropping in $2 or $5 into the, the bucket and uh, letting us continue to make all of this for you. Uh, until next time, for the crew, this is Noah Nelson, and um, you'll hear my voice again in like 24 hours or something. <laughs> <laughs>